the future of their calling, powerful stuff there, and I've heard from many of the folks, uh, there was a group of athletes, actually, that went to the local church uh, to Haiti as well during the break, and, and God did some powerful things there too, so I want to encourage you to take the opportunity to go on these trips, not only do we have an opportunity to serve and, and to be able to help um, serve people who are in need, but probably the most important thing that can happen is that we are changed. You know, I mean, there are people we could send our money and the work would be done by somebody else. But what happens when we go is that God begins to move on us and begins to do something powerful in us. And so I hope you heard some of that here. I want to tell you, tomorrow night at 7.30 here in the chapel, I want to welcome you all to come. We're going to have our CDOC commissioning service. Um, for those students that go through our CBOC classes, which should be all of you, so sign up for CBOC. I know you're registering for classes. Sign up for CBOC 110. I'll see you in the fall. But, but if you complete the entirety of the CBOC two-year curriculum, uh, you have an opportunity during your senior year to be commissioned by the Lamp Center for Christian Service. And so tomorrow night, we're going to gather, and there's 11 people, 10 people, um, that are going to be commissioned um, tomorrow night. And we're going to get to hear what God is calling them to do, and we're going to be able to bless them um, and activate them as they leave this place and do ministry. And part of that service will anoint them with oil and pray for them, and we'll also give them this Lance Center medallion, which they'll be able to wear at graduation. And this Lance Center medallion means a great deal to us because there's more than 100 students now who are um, who have been commissioned by the Lance Center over the last uh, 13, 14 years um, that we've been commissioning students. So this is a, a very meaningful um, symbol for us. Well, we also have on very few, uh, just a handful of occasions, we've also awarded uh, the Lance Center medallion to some faculty and staff persons who have been critical to our work. And tonight, uh, it's my honor to present Jim Green with the Lance Center medallion for his long <laughs> that you're going to be able to say about you. So for more than 40 years, Jim has served the theater community and the University of Indianapolis as he has lived out his calling among us. Besides his long-standing career as a theater designer and actor, Jim has also earned a master's degree from Christian Theological Seminary here in Indianapolis and actively serves his church in various leadership roles. Within the Lance Center for Christian Formation, Jim has served as a faculty mentor for students for about 10 years with us. He has served on the planning team for the Lilly Fellows Network Planning Committee, has provided tools training for countless mission groups to ASP, <laughs> and most recently has co-led the service pilgrimage to Appalachia with Chapel Nairi. Jim is a regular participant in our campus book studies and sharing my story events, and has himself shared his story of call in a Sharing My Story event, as well as in a recorded presentation for the Network for Theological Exploration and Undergraduate Education. He has served for many years as the faculty representative for UND's participation in the Lilly Fellows Network for the Humanities in church-related universities. And while those roles, uh, those sort of official roles, are important uh, to the life of this institution and for Jim's uh, good university citizenship, uh, Jim will undoubtedly be remembered for his faithful, informal mentoring and care for students. Stories of Jim forming a drama troupe of UND students for church summer camps, of performing weddings for those who are disenfranchised by their religious communities, and for mentoring students who are not the most talented or popular in the theater community <laughs> have become expected as we hear um, many students and former students talk about Jim. While many of us will miss his voice as the MC for dozens of university events, his greatest impact has most certainly been hundreds of students he has cared for, taught, and mentored in his more than 40 years of service. So Jim, I want to honor you with the medallion of the Lance Center for Christian Formation for the life of service among us.
you that have worked with Jim or have been students of Jim, I want to invite you forward, and we're going to lay hands and pray for him. Uh, so please uh, come forward. You can come over here. Yeah, you can a lot of them. So. <laughs> For you. <laughs> um, I, I do want to thank Jeremiah, where, where, there you are, and the, the student leaders who asked me to do this tonight. They probably had no idea of the, the circular coincidence that happens because of this. One of the first things that I did when I started at the University of Indianapolis, actually 45 years ago, in either 72 or 73, I don't remember which year it was, um, I was asked to speak or preach at a chapel service. At that time, it was a little different than it would be tonight right here because it was a required chapel. It was at 10 in the morning, Ramsburg Auditorium, every seat was filled, everyone had assigned seats, the dean stood up in the balcony and checked off the people who were missing. And next year. <laughs> That was the atmosphere that I was going into. Now, the reason I was asked to do this, it doesn't happen to new faculty members on a regular basis, but the summer immediately before that, I had served as the keynoter uh, for the entire summer up at Edward Forest, which was, uh, many of you know, the United Methodist uh, Youth Institute, or High School Institute, I think is what they officially call it. It's a church camp for high school students. Mm -hmm. And they would traditionally invite the keynoter to deliver the chapel service. And I was crazy enough to say yes. They were crazy enough to ask me. Because you've got to realize I was very young. It was the 1970s. <laughs> think, think late 60s. Think 60s more so. I had a rebellious streak in me that was a mile long. And I don't remember exactly what I said, but I know that I said some, some things just for shock. <laughs> and I do know that the dean was shocked, <laughs> and I am happy to say that I am still here. <laughs> so in some ways it's kind of lucky that, uh, that I am still here. And now, as I begin my message this evening at this chapel, I'm you know, kind of reminded of that circular nature of that. Uh, Michael Cartwright knows of one of my favorite songs. One of our favorite artists is Harry Chapin. And one of my favorite songs is All My Life's a Circle. Sunrise and sundown, the moon rolls through the nighttime until the daybreak comes around. And I realized so many times in my life that circular nature, that thing that started me at UND, 
is about to be one of the last things I do before I retire. Um, I'll be retiring at the end. I am teaching a spring term class, but that will, uh, it's, and, and this is certainly an honor that uh, makes that very, very special. But I invite you to join me this evening because I want to share some construction tips. We just got back from an Appalachian service project where we were digging and and we actually, we didn't do some building, but we got to use saws, and I was really impressed with our group who, when I did the tool training, they had that saws all out, and the saw, and they're going, uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing that. It was all they could do, pick up a hammer. And by the end of the time, we had saws alls and circular saws, and every single one of these people was chopping up that kitchen floor like a pro in that instance. What I'd like you to do tonight, though, is uh, get out your mental wheelbarrows and your hammer and get your saws ready. Because for more than 45 years, I have been constructing scenery, and designing and constructing scenery. And uh, back in the 90s, as my wife Paula will, will remind us, when we adopted our third child and lived up here in the neighborhood, or wherever it is, somewhere over there, um, and we lived in a two-bedroom house with a family of five, and a one and a half bathrooms, and that the half was actually a laundry room. We kind of said, we've either got to move or we've got to build on. And I had always wanted to build a house. It had kind of been a, a, a checklist of mine or a bucket list, whatever you want to call it. So I said, well, let's, let's build this thing. And started kind of working on the plans for that and thinking about it. I had never built a house before in my life, but I thought, I've got to be able to do this. Um, and, and we decided, decided to build in that process. My experiences from all of these construction kinds of things have helped me to realize that building physical structure has many enlightening parallels with building a life and building a faith, depending on how you want to look at that. Now, I should kind of give you a, a little bit of a warning. As a theater designer and someone in the theater who constructs things, we build things to last for three weeks in the theater. We build it, and actually if it falls down right after opening night, or closing night, not opening night, but closing <laughs> night, then that's great because it makes it easier for us to take the part. So it's, it's a very short-term build, and as I was building the addition onto our house, which is about a thousand square feet, um, every day I would get up and I would remind myself that I am not building this for three weeks. I'm building this hopefully for a hundred years, and I need to build it with that in mind. So I'm probably taking this more from building a house than I am from building scenery in the theater. What I'd like to do, though, is kind of take a look at some of the best practices in building. I can't speak for you, but for my life, it's always been under construction. I am always rebuilding parts of my life, adding on other parts, making some serious repairs, and occasionally sitting back and enjoying the results of my hard work, and uh, excuse me a minute, between hay fever and surprises, see do that. So these are just some best practices, some tips that I would like to share with you about building a life. I learned this one very early, and that is that you can't do it alone. You will try. And you will learn that there are some things that require help. It may be as simple as a person whose presence gives you someone to talk to. Paula was that person for me. She had no idea what I was saying every day when I would talk through, okay, here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to put the 2 by 8 joists in there on 16 inch center so that I've got the such and such and so and so. And she'd go, yes. Right. And she just shook her head and smiled and listened. And that's exactly what I needed at that point. I needed somebody to, I need to verbalize what I'm doing and talk it through someone, someone who would smile and somehow let me know that I'm okay and I'm going to be all right and I'm not going to uh, have a house that falls down a few years later. Sometimes you need good advice. You know, one of the things that happened to us when we started building, we had a, some friends here on the faculty who said, you know, there's a guy here in the neighborhood, Danny Rusher, Ariane knows him because that's He's, a, he's your landlord, right? Uh, he's a wonderful person, and he's a contractor. And they said, he's a contractor. He would help you. And they're going, I do not ask lawyers and doctors for free advice. I will not ask a professional contractor to give me free advice on this. But 
I was at a like a, a party right after graduation with some faculty members at Paul Krasnowski's house, actually. And Danny came up to me and said, I hear you're going to be building. I'd be glad to help you. Maybe I could come over, look over your plans, give you some advice, and help you figure out what to do. Um, and he did. I warned him I'd take him up on him. He came over and made some wonderful suggestions. And then on a regular basis, Denny would stop by. He'd stop by early in the morning on his way to his projects, and he would just kind of go, you know, you need to probably put these two by fours over, move that over just a little bit, because later on that's going to help you when you get up to the top. And Denny would provide me advice and support, and it wasn't just Denny. Paul Krasnowski helped me pour concrete in the <laughs> foundation. It's hard for you to believe if you know Paul Krasnowski. But give that man a wheelbarrow full of concrete and he can move mountains. Um, Dave Watts, our acting provost right now, or our temporary provost, uh, taught me to drywall and came in and helped me put the roof on, on the addition in that process also. So you just cannot do it alone. There's a lot that you can, but there's some things you just have to have help for. One of the most difficult jobs of building is to, building an addition, is to tie in the new roof with the old roof so that it doesn't look really like it was hacked on. You, you want it to look good. And it's, it was kind of beyond my skills. I might have been able to do it, but it would have taken me a long time. And Danny said, I'll send my carpenter over. Well, Skip. Skip came over and was, he's a, he was a genius as a carpenter. Uh, just absolutely incredible. Could, Credible could do things. I would have gotten out my programmable calculator and figured out the sign of the angle to cut the thing, and, the, the, and every single cut would have probably taken me an hour. Skip would just take his little carpenter square out and just kind of go, eh, cut this long, cut it here, and I'd go cut it, and it would fit absolutely perfectly. And if you look at the house down at 4315 Asbury, you will not be able to see where the two roofs meet. Uh, just it, it, it's just wonderful. So sometimes it, it really does help to have a, a carpenter show up. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I know a carpenter. <laughs> we just heard some of his words a few minutes ago in Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Therefore hear these words of mine and put them into practice like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. The rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew, and, the, and beat against the house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. The second tip that I would give you is that the best way to learn to build is to build build it backwards, or actually <laughs> take it down. Hindsight is wonderful, and when you, the first time you build a house, it's not till you get all the way up to framing the roof that you realize, oh no, I should have put that two by four here to support the tons of snow that would be on the roof and carry that load all the way down through the, to the very foundation that I just dug and that Paul Krasnowski helped me pour. <laughs> Um, and now, Denny helped me figure that out. It's, you know, that, that person came and helped me, and Skip helped me figure that out also. But contractors learn from others' mistakes. They learn from their successes and their mistakes. And the best way to learn to build a house is to build it a second time or to take it apart. We kind of got to do that with Judy's place down in Appalachia. We got to see how a house was built as we, or how it was, was built, perhaps not as well as it should have been as we took it apart in that instance. So it kind of helps to be able to go backwards. Now, it's, you can't exactly do that with your life, if you're building a life, because that which has happened to us is in the past, and we can't go back and change that. But what we can do in our lives is start again. Think of all of the times in your life when you get to start again, a new semester, a new job, new friends, a life-changing event, such as a, a marriage, or children coming into your life, or a mountaintop experience, or being born again, or being born again for the, or being born for the first time. <laughs> Whatever it is that helps you start over again. And we have those opportunities in our lives to do it again. 
to take advantage of the successes and failures and do it over again. I have a former student who, uh, and I wasn't actually, I wasn't thinking about sharing this, but decided to do this. He was in a, a car accident up in uh, northern Indiana, southern Michigan, and uh, struck a pedestrian and killed him. Um, he was not texting. He was not impaired. He was not drunk. But for some reason, the police and the judge decided that he needed to be punished for this, um, in spite of the fact that the victim's family did not want him to spend any jail time. He ended up spending almost two years of his life in jail, and then several more years after that on probation. And I can tell you that even in that situation, where at that moment for him and for his family, it just seemed like that would be that would be a blotch on his record for the rest of his life. How are you ever going to rebuild from that? He did. He has. He's a, you know, living a wonderful life with a, 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 a you know wonderful relationship with someone. Um, and has just turned his life around in that process from that very, very tragic situation. Not just to mention the, the, the guilt that he experienced for the accident that, that he caused in that instance, or was certainly uh, a causal factor with that. A third suggestion that I would give you, and it's kind of the most important one, and it goes back to the title of my message tonight, and that is you need a strong foundation. Um, and the title of my message was a faith below the frost line. When you're building a building, you have to dig below the surface. You have to get below the geographical frost line. Here in this area, it's 32 inches. As you get a little farther south, like down in Jonesville, Virginia, where we were, it's only 24 inches. If you don't go low enough, which was one of the problems that Judy had, her foundation was actually just some rocks sitting on the ground and the wood's just resting right on top of that, and it gave a wonderful path for the termites and, um, and the dry rot to come in. But the other thing that happens in that instance, if you don't get below the frost line, is that the ground freezes, then it thaws, and it freezes again, and then it thaws, and that foundation, whatever it is, moves. Um, in the same way that if you've ever gardened or you've ever done yard work, that rock wasn't there last week. It literally gets pushed up by the, the ground as it moves and changes, as it freezes and thaws. Think about all the potholes. You don't want to build a house on that kind of uh, lack of structure, the potholes we have on our streets. You want to go down below the frost line, where when you lay that concrete or those concrete blocks, it's going to be there, it's going to stay there, and it's not going to move. In our lives, we kind of have to do that with our faith and our beliefs in that instance. And how do you do that? How do you get that? Faith below a frost line. How do you get a, a foundation that will withstand, as, as one of my favorite um, authors and preachers, Paul Tillich says, the shaking of the foundations. You know, you are at a time, for most of you at any rate in your lives, where actually, because you are here, I have a feeling you probably have a pretty good foundation right now, most of you. But you are also at a time in, in your life where those foundations are going to be challenged. It's going to happen in classes, it's going to happen in relationships, it's going to happen as things happen in your life that seem perhaps very traumatic, and you will be challenged, but what you need to do is trust the fact that you've got those roots that go down below the frost line that are still going to be there. It comes from family, from friends, friends that you have today, from chapel services and worship services and books that you read. I do have some suggestions on how you can build that faith below the frost line. And the first one is actually to read. Uh, yes, scripture is kind of the obvious one in a chapel service, but read inspirational books. Read messages from other people. Uh, read as much as you can and learn from those people in that process. Perhaps even textbooks in that instance. Secondly, you should plan Plan what you're going to do. Plan your life, but be flexible, because whatever you plan, it is going to change. Don't necessarily resist that change. Celebrate it. Welcome it. It's kind of like the experience that we had down in Jonesville. We didn't know what we were getting into until every day when we went there, and you just never know. One of, they never mentioned, but one of the advantages of having 17 dogs, 
to help keep the snakes away. <laughs> a third tip in this instance to get that fade below across the line is know when to take a break. When you get overwhelmed, sometimes you just need to stop, get away, process what you're doing. I know I did that when I was building the addition on our house. There were some days where I'm just going, I just can't do this anymore. And I would just stop and kind of take a break. And I came back refreshed, renewed, and worked twice as fast at the project that I was working on. And finally, fun, not finally, fourth thing, find a good mentor. And um, I'm going to go ahead and say this. Find a good mentor other than some old guy from the Bible. You know, the, the teachings of Jesus and the disciples is wonderful, and it's really, you know, it gives us lots of things that we can live by and that we can guide our life by, but you need a living mentor, not somebody who's just in the pages of a book. You need somebody that you look up to that is a role model for you, and in fact, someone who can actually help you understand those people that you might admire in the Bible, because they are living out the teachings of Jesus and the teachings that we, the good teachings that we learn from, from Bible stories and Bible verses and the parables of Jesus, all of those kinds of things. You know, think about the people in your life that would be good mentors for you and learn from them and help, let them help you understand what's going on. And then finally, listen to the carpenter, just like I listened to Skip, he was so good. Master, what is the greatest commandment? Skip didn't say this, somebody else did. That you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And that you love your neighbor as yourself. Not your neighbor who happens to agree with you, vote like you, look like you, belong to the same clubs. Your neighbor. All of your neighbors. You will always be building something physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. I have a feeling that most of you, like I said, because you're here tonight, have a good foundation. Keep it. It's a piece of advice that my youth minister gave me when I went off to college. He said, you are going to have, I don't remember exactly how he said it, but they're going to shake your foundation. There, you are going to wake up some days and wonder which way is up. And, and I certainly did. But he said, you've got a good foundation. Remember that. Don't lose it. And there were some times in my life when I got a long ways away from that came back to it. I could always come back to it. I could always find it in that sense. Keep it, take care of it, and build a life with the help of others that you can look back on and be proud of. And I thank you for letting me do this tonight.